All right, welcome everybody. We're here today to talk about the marketplace dilemma and unlocking unique supply uh, to either boost your marketplace if you're a startup, uh, and also as your company achieves scale, you've got to think about protecting your, your position and your defensibility. So let's get started. Uh, if you learn one thing today, I want you to, to really learn how you can use supply to your unique advantage. So many people are focused on demand um, and some startups think about supply, uh, but I don't think a lot of startups realize that they have a unique advantage. Now, a lot of people talk about disruption. Uh, there's the TechCrunch Disrupt Conference, and this all came from uh, the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, that talks about market leaders who don't see an opportunity in a less profitable and <clears throat> a smaller segment, often for an inferior product. So they focus on their larger, more profitable core, and then that creates uh, you know, a weakness where other disruptors come in with an inferior product that costs less, often less profitable at first, but it ends up having more mass market appeal. And eventually they lose market share because of that and become irrelevant. And so you know, this happened with uh, PCs and computers and mainframes. It happened with hard drives. It happened in a few different areas. Um, so Clayton Christensen wrote this book, The Innovator's Dilemma. It's, it's definitely recommended reading if you haven't read it already, and it's interesting. Uh, but a lot of people overuse this term disrupt in other areas uh, where it doesn't really meet the, the definition that Clayton laid out in his book exactly. And I thought I would kind of put a finer point on how uh, a similar effect shakes out, but it's a little bit different in marketplaces. And I'm calling this the marketplace dilemma. So in the marketplace dilemma, a marketplace operator, whether you're, you're just getting started um, you know, at a, a seed stage startup, your series A, B growth, or all the way up to a public company, you're always balancing profitability with growth and supply acquisition. Um, and so you have, to, you have to think about this. And this is what we're going to double click on today, both how um, it's an exposure for a larger company. You've always got to be watching to make sure you don't get outflanked. And it's also an opportunity for the younger companies out there um, to, to find those weaknesses. So first, let's start a little bit with uh, who I am. So I'm a marketplace CEO uh, turned venture investor now. I'm at Canvas Ventures. We're a series A and B investment firm. You know, we're currently investing out of our uh, $300 million second fund. Uh, and we do a lot of marketplace investing as well as enterprise software, you know, and other consumer investing. Uh, and before that, you know, I started my career after grad school at Summit Partners, investing back in 2006. Uh, and then I uh, left Summit and did 10 years of company building. So I'm a, uh, you know, startup and marketplace operator. I co-founded Stitcher, a, a podcast company. I was at Trial Pay. I started uh, the most expensive iPhone app, BarMax. Uh, but most of my operating experience was actually at Yelp. I spent seven years as an executive at Yelp, uh, led, you know, uh, over 100 partnerships, bunch of uh, corporate development and M&A transactions, uh, and then acquired a company called E24, first found E24 when it was small, about 10 people, less than a million in revenue, partnered with them, became E24's biggest source of new users and traffic. Um, and then E24 really grew up. Uh, we acquired the company uh, and it became pretty large. It got to about $500 million in gross transaction volume over that annualized. Um, over 500 employees. So uh, it was a, a lot of fun and a fun ride in the inside kind of front row seat to one of the most interesting uh, marketplace uh, battles uh, in, in the food delivery wars uh, that the industry has seen. So uh, then three years ago, I went back into the investing side, uh, first at Social Capital, now at Canvas, and I have made um, you know marketplace investments and other software investments. So that's where kind of my perspective comes from. And we'll talk about uh, a few different industries today. Uh, and today I thought about, I thought we would talk about uh, three examples of this marketplace dilemma playing out in different verticals, and then three strategies to navigate that dilemma. And, you know, think about how you balance growth and profitability as a marketplace operator. And ultimately, uh, for all the startups here, how you can take advantage of this and really unlock supply in an interesting way uh, to kind of break through to your industry. So what I want you to think about as we're going through this talk and you know, happy to engage. If you wanna put questions in the chat, I'll, you know, we'll look at those and save some time at the end. Happy to engage on that too, of how you can take down who you might think be, is an incumbent now with a very strong position, because actually they've got this weakness due to the marketplace dilemma. So examples. 
The first example I, I thought we'd talk about, and I, you know, this is much talked about, it's near and dear to my heart, um, but I thought I'd double click on a, a few of the details uh, that might not be obvious to everybody in the room, maybe some of you are aware, uh, around food delivery and the food delivery supply hack. So a big question people ask, uh, you know, when you see the growth of Uber Eats, is why didn't Grubhub bring on more restaurant supply, you know, more quickly? Uh, you know, and, and so the, the interesting part is you have to realize that Grubhub at first had a very, very profitable 30%, you know, EBITDA margin business. That was for E24 when we acquired the company. The interesting thing is um, E24 uh, grew to that to the level we acquired them, which was about 150 million in top line gross, gross transaction volume with no outside capital, no venture funding, uh, totally bootstrapped. Why? Because matching restaurants with consumers and not doing last mile delivery, which Grubhub, Seamless, E24, all the original players in that market, they didn't do any last mile delivery. And that was an extremely profitable business. However, Postmates then came along um, and then you know DoorDash and Uber Eats. Um, and this was the unlock. So, so you gotta realize prior to, to those kind of, you know, especially DoorDash coming in, Grubhub and Seamless, you know, they merged and had a lock on kind of the entire eastern half of the U.S. E24 had, you know, the majority of market share in a lot of the West Coast. Um, and these guys were all sitting pretty, just running off restaurants that had their own delivery provider at a 30% EBITDA margin. And it looked like a market that kind of couldn't be touched and just a com competition between these highly profitable uh, players. Grubhub, after the Seamless merger, then went public and, you know, it was no accident their stock price ran up because uh, it was a very successful story. But this is what I want to show you both. You know, you got to watch this. If you're a larger company, this is your Achilles heel. Um, and this is your opportunity as a startup. The insight was, hey, the universe of restaurants that could deliver to you is not just restaurants with their own delivery provider. Now, that seems obvious to us now. But I can tell you in 2010, you know, when I started Yelp, this wasn't obvious. Um, and when we start, first started doing these partnerships with local marketplaces, there weren't obvious solutions. You know, Postmates was doing Get It Now. They had a few other restaurants to supplement, but they, they only had a few. Um, you know, fast forward later, they were able to massively add the, uh, to the amount of supply and the amount of restaurants to deliver, where now people expect nearly any restaurant they want um, can deliver. Um, and in particular, uh, DoorDash then doubled down. And once they had this big, reliable delivery infrastructure, they were able to add chain restaurants. Um, and chain restaurants was a huge hack because historically, Domino's, Pizza Hut, and pizza chains were the only chains that delivered. And so you couldn't get fast food like uh, McDonald's, which is now an Uber Eats, and then really all the rest, uh, you know, Chick-fil-A uh, and Taco Bell and KFC, all those kinds of businesses, you couldn't get delivered to your house. Even though they produce the food really fast, it's cheap, it's actually the perfect delivery product, but they just kind of didn't think they left that to the pizza guys. And so DoorDash, Uber Eats, Postmates were actually able to double down there as well and grow supply even further, where now, uh, you know, th their volume is outnumbering, uh, you know, what you see on Grubhub. So we're going to double click more on this as well when we talk about um, the specific strategies. But let's look at a, another vertical also, um, another one near and dear to my heart, which is restaurant reservations. Uh, because historically you had Open Table and Open Table dominated, you know, they were one of the really these first local marketplaces that consumers could go and, and book something right there. They were one of Yelp's first transactional partnerships where you could just go in Yelp and book a seat on OpenTable right there in the Yelp interface. It was really convenient. And for a while, you know, OpenTable had uh, well over, you know, Grubhub, by the way, when they merged with Seamless, at one point, I think they had over 75% uh, market share for online uh, food delivery. And OpenTable had probably over 90% um, share of uh, restaurant reservations that were being done online. Your only other alternative, um, which there were a lot out there, were to call on the phone. Um, but then SeatMe came in uh, and a couple other little startups. And they had an innovative model because, again, uh, OpenTable was very profitable. They charged a per diner fee for everyone who sat down. And some restaurants were really unhappy about this. Uh, for example, the Slanted Door was paying Open Table $200,000 a year, popular restaurant in San Francisco. Now that seems like a lot for your restaurant reservation software, especially because Open Table didn't really have a ton of marginal cost um, on those added diners. Um, so CME came in with uh, you know, an easier model and a flat fee and turned that eventually with Yelp's help. So we acquired them at Yelp 
um, and, and called it Yelp Reservations and got it down to $2,500 a year. So literally two orders of magnitude savings, 100x less on price from 200,000 down to, uh, you know, around 2000 was pretty incredible. Um, and there are other upstarts that came in, Resi, um, you know, and a few others. Um, but again, these guys were able to come in. Salana Door was a high-end restaurant that Open Table already had. But Yelp Reservations, which is what we called Seat Me Again, they were able to come in and add uh, many more restaurants that would have never thought about being on Open Table because it was too complicated. It was a big software installation. And now it was an easy iPad, on-demand, uh, very simple experience uh, for a lot less money. And so a lot more restaurants said, hey, we'll, we'll be on there. And so again, this is the supply hack. This is the Achilles heel. Because now all of a sudden, if you've got a lot more market share like Yelp Reservations does in, in key West Coast cities, now people might think to, to go there first. So let's talk about another area where you see this as well, which is home sharing uh, marketplaces. So HomeAway, VRBO, they merged and they were ahead of the game on Airbnb. They were making $12,000 uh, per rental, uh, had a profitability focus, and it seemed like a great business. And if instead of staying in a hotel, you wanted a one week, two week or longer kind of vacation rental type stay in somewhere like Lake Tahoe or, or anywhere else, you know, HomeAway or VRBO was a, a great choice uh, for you to go to. But Airbnb came in, and, and again, you're seeing this story play out uh, you know, over and over. Uh, they came in and said, hey, what if we can massively increase supply? What if we can think about there's a, you know, a way that anybody with a couch or an extra room um, could actually be a host um, and could rent out space on Airbnb? What if we rent for only one or two days at a time and we're not worried about only being you know, these quote unquote kind of long-term vacation rentals, sometimes in regulated cities, but we're really open it up so um, and the behavior you started seeing is people would leave town. People would be in San Francisco. They leave town for the weekend and then they put their apartment up on Airbnb. And that's a lot more inventory. And now Airbnb has significantly more inventory than, than HomeAway, VRBO, even though they were a public company you know, much earlier um, and, and originally had much bigger market share. Uh, so you see this story play out again and again. And so what are the strategies? How can you take advantage of this um, and actually have some specific tactics that can help you grow your startup. And also, as you get larger, what do you need to watch for on the defensibility side? So first is to unlock that differentiated supply efficiently. And the thing I like about this slide is if you look at the graph, it's a little bit small. You can see that Grubhub market share. It's the, the blue in the bottom. Um, and now this starts a little bit later in 2018. But if you look earlier, it would be much higher and it kind of came down. Um, and then, you know, DoorDash is the orange, just started taking more and more share. And they did that um, by just grabbing all this differentiated supply. Lots of local restaurants, you know, the ones who didn't have their own last mile delivery and doing that reliably, I think that was a key part of the story. And then chain restaurants was uh, the other piece that we already talked about. So finding a way to do that quickly, efficiently, reliably, figuring out where is the new supply sitting under our nose? And I'll give three suggestions in the example categories we have now uh, in a little bit to open your mind, because I think a lot of people think this food delivery story is done, but it's not. So, so we'll come back to that in a moment. So what's another strategy? Well, you can also add value to the supply side experience. So, uh, you know, the, a lot of people think the supply side experience is fixed. For example, in food delivery, you might have thought, well, we're dependent on these delivery drivers, however long they take. Um, but DoorDash said, no, we can make this extremely reliable. We can have a little blue dot on a map like you're used to with Uber and Lyft, tracking exactly where your food is. We can give you reliable time estimates. We can create incentive systems for the dashers and for the restaurants alike and get your food to you on time. Uh, you know, the other one is, uh, example here is SeatMe. SeatMe said, we can provide a much better product experience. We can put an iPad at your you know, front of house Open table is shifting, shipping expensive Windows PC installations, almost like on-prem software. They would break. They would require support. There was a big tower. Um, you know, a lot of things could go wrong. People would be calling the open table support line late at night trying to get it fixed. And remember, they're paying a dollar fifty per diner. Uh, Salana Door racking up that two hundred thousand dollar bill. That's not fun either. Um, if you can create this simplified ex product experience, uh, because your tech stack is going to often be 10 years more modern than the incumbents. And you can use a, you know, an easier, more consumer, consumerized uh, experience for the current age, even on the, the business-facing or supply-side-facing uh, supply part of your experience. You can win the hearts and minds of the supply side and get them on board, which ultimately helps with demand. 
And finally, um, you know, the, the last strategy is balancing periods of growth and profitability. So the interesting thing I have uh, uh, below here are these three graphs in the three industries we talked about. With uh, in the red, you see profit margin. In the blue, you see growth. And you can see in each case, uh, outside of Grubhub, where they did have to take a profitability hit as they started thinking about moving into last mile, uh, HomeAway and OpenTable, they kept margins pretty consistent. And, and these are a little bit in the past at the time periods where they're most vulnerable. But you can see they all had this dip in market share. And that's because they had this exposure. And so as a larger company, one thing you might have to think about is, can we actually take a hit uh, to our profitability now? Uh, is it worth it? to maintain share and not have to take a hit to growth later. But I can tell you, here's the really interesting insight. Um, and a lot of startups don't realize this. We call it tyranny of the revenue um, and tyranny of profitability. When you're a young, profitable company, when you're Grubhub, you know, and you went public recently, you can't just burn the boats and become very unprofitable very quickly. When you're Yelp uh, and you've got this E24 division like we had, it was 10% of our revenue. Um, and, and, but I was you know, proposing, hey, maybe we need to get more aggressive on last mile delivery. That was very hard for Yelp to do as a young, profitable company. There were you know, automated headlines um, by these websites that every time if Yelp missed earnings by even a penny, would say, oh, you know, Yelp's unprofitable or losing money. So pro uh, public companies are very sensitive to their profitability and they're under intense scrutiny that private companies aren't. And it's why so many of these private companies have delayed going public for a really long time while they can. And so that's your advantage. And by the way, even Airbnb, private companies, they're later stage now, they're under scrutiny to, to get more and more profitable too, especially with this macro environment. So you do have this opportunity kind of, you know, summing it up in, in Bezos's words, your margin is my opportunity, as he said. And so here's, here's where I said earlier, I would tell you about, you know, being open-minded and brainstorming. Uh, for these three examples, what are innovative ways to unlock supply? Okay, well, in food delivery, what's food delivery 3.0? We had 1.0 Grubhub, 2.0 DoorDash. Maybe there's gonna be you know, delivery from home chefs, ready-made meals, frozen meals to your door. There are so many innovative models. Maybe those will be half the price and unlock a whole new supply of cooking and food that we didn't think possible that ends up being bigger than DoorDash and Uber Eats. Uh, home sharing 3.0, uh, maybe your, your room in your home is, is limiting how we're thinking about it. There's startups like HipCamp um, and others that are opening up any open space, right? Especially now um, with, with COVID, maybe people will be interested in getting RVs and going around the country. There will be a renaissance there. This could be their moment. And maybe the way we're thinking about vacation rentals is actually quite limited and inventory could be 10 X um, and, and somebody could become the market leader over Airbnb that way. Uh, Upwork 3.0, uh, if you think about labor marketplaces, uh, you know, maybe there will be verticalized labor marketplaces more. We're already seeing that and they'll zoom in more and more. So I, I would say if you're building any kind of marketplace, the first thing to think about is, is there an incumbent here? Uh, why or why not? Is there a big 800 pound gorilla? And, and what's their weakness? Uh, what is it that they're kind of, uh, you know, what's their tyranny to revenue or profitability? And is there something hiding under our nose where there's a massive opportunity to increase supply? Can any of these history lessons or examples or strategies help you? Um, you know, and I'd be really interested in examples of how you're thinking about that as well in the questions today or follow up with me later. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at new Mike. Um, that's just N-E-W-M-I-K-E. -E. Um, so you can also uh, hit me up there. So, you know, Again, my last question for you is how can you acquire differentiated supply? Um, this is the summary of the marketplace dilemma. Here are the examples we went over today, food delivery, restaurant reservations, home sharing. Here are the three strategies, you know, unlock differentiated supply, think broadly, try to brainstorm, think about, you know, what's, what's a way you can unlock kind of another whole order of magnitude. If, if you're just thinking about a little bit of incremental supply you're gonna open up, you might be too limited in how you're thinking about it. Think about how you can add value and create a better supply side experience. And then thinking about balancing periods of profitability and growth. I will say in 2020, it might not be the time to massively sacrifice profitability in the name of growth. You will have to show some profitability now because investors are more focused on that than ever. And if you need profitability and, and outside capital to survive, um, you've got to think about that. So with that, uh, we will now take it to uh, the chat and questions. Thank you guys. I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. All right, so um, I'll start with uh, the first one here I see from Samir. 
which is, uh, would the most effective strategy be to unlock differentiated supply or acquire latent supply? Um, so I guess the nuance here is in how you define uh, unlock uh, differentiated supply and, and what you're calling latent supply, but I think it's differentiated supply. I think if you're just getting latent supply, the incumbent would already go chase that. They've already got armies of business development people and other people trying to turn over rocks that they're not seeing. It's unlocking the different supply that's harder for them to get. I think that's what's more interesting. Okay, let's scroll up uh, a little bit higher. Uh, somebody asked if we're going to share slides after the talk. I think there's going to be a video. Um, next question is, Ben Preston, uh, how do you think about creating stickiness with your supply beyond just lower cost? Um, so there's a few different ways. Uh, you know, one way is OpenTable actually experimented with uh, exclusive contracts. I think Grubhub did this too, but they came under scrutiny of the New York Attorney General. Maybe there was an article about that. Uh, and so it's, it's a little tricky, especially in this environment. I don't know that exclusive contracts is the way to go. What you'd rather have is what I'd call a de facto exclusive, where your product is, is, is so sticky that someone wouldn't even need an exclusive contract. Uh, technological lock-in is a way to do that. So uh, you'll hear about these SaaS-enabled marketplaces where the, the marketplace tries to layer on a SaaS tool that's indispensable. Uh, and because of that, um, the supply side has no choice uh, but to stick with it. Uh, in food delivery, that's been notoriously difficult. So everyone has these tablets and they try to have like a better tablet experience, but it doesn't really matter. And um, consumers are, I mean, sorry, restaurants are just willing to switch to anybody else's tablet. Um, but you've got Cloud Kitchens, uh, a company I invested in while it's social capital. They've got some proprietary technology uh, at their facilities, and that is an interesting way to, to kind of create a, a little bit of a supply lock-in. So, so think about, thinking about product things beyond just contractual um, ways, I, I think that gets kind of interesting. Um, Mike Rosenbaum uh, said, great session, Mike. What's your view on parking 3.0? Look, I think that's a great example. People probably dismiss parking. There's been a few um, examples of these parking marketplaces. None of them have grown into like Airbnb or food delivery size. But there could be a massive opportunity there um, that could get really interesting with the rise of autonomous vehicles and a potential surge in driving now that a lot of um, public transit's restricted, uh, rethinking our, our parking spaces. Um, that could be interesting. How do you massively open supply there? I, I'd be interested to talk about that later. Um, Joe Mellon asks, how do you know if your niche is too small? And I think that's a great question. I think the parking companies, I saw a few of them that started about 10 years ago. It turned out for a lot of them that it, it was a little bit small at the time. Um, and that's, that's always a challenge. And I have to tell you, um, Uber uh, black cars, the private driver for everyone, their initial model, most investors thought was too small as well. So you have to kind of believe that there's um, the potential for your market to get really big. Uh, but ultimately, I don't know if founders always know if their niche is too small. So that's a challenge. Do some market sizing, do some bottoms up. But I would say one of the biggest mistakes and failures of imagination is not being able to picture how the market could drastically increase in size from where it is today. Because where your market size is today, um, by definition, isn't going to be the market you're going to exit at. Otherwise, the incumbents would be chasing it right now. So you know a secret that everyone else doesn't know. You've got to take advantage of that. Um, Manfredi Sassoli said, do you think VCs should really look for profitability more than they did before? Don't the same market rules apply together with the same size of commercial opportunities? So yes, in a logically perfect world, VCs, um, you know, view on growth versus profitability shouldn't change. But VCs, like everybody else, are affected by the news and kind of sentiment. And there are realities. Like for me as an early stage investor, I'm saying, hey, the capital market for late stage companies might dry up. So if I'm going to invest in someone with the strategy of grow, grow, grow and sacrifice profitability and don't worry about, we'll make it up on volume. Um, that strategy is going to be very difficult if later stage financing and, you know, SoftBank and some other sources are, are, are going to be more dry to them than they were five years ago. So um, it, the same market rules, I would say, do not apply. Um, and, and happy to talk about that further. Um, Peter Lerman asks, uh, great presentation. How do you balance what you pay your supply when your suppliers have different margins on their end and can afford um, to accept? So... You know, you can provide discounts. Uh, E24 and a lot of the food delivery guys started with lower take rates, um, you know, sometimes 5% promotional rates, then worked their way up to 10. You know, a while ago when I was checking, Grubhub was at 16% for the pure marketplace model. 
for the food delivery guys that were doing last mile delivery, they've had to be between 20 and 30%, often like 25%, because they've got to pay those drivers, um, you know, in addition to the tips. Uh, but ultimately, you do have to standardize um, some of the supply side kind of take rate stuff. Otherwise, you get hit for it not being fair. And, uh, you know, the supply will find a way. I, you know, the guidance I give people is you should be charging at least 5% as a take rate because um, credit card companies charge 3%. And if you can't charge a little bit above what the credit card companies charge, then, you know, are you even adding enough value? And above 20% starts to become a question mark. So the sweet spot is somewhere in the teens, maybe 20, because after 30 or 40, uh, the supply side will try to disintermediate you. Would you suggest being more price competitive versus offering more value for the same price to win over supply? This is Maria uh, Ryback. I would always suggest uh, offering more value than being price competitive. Uh, the classic startup mistake that uh, Andreessen Horowitz likes to talk about is underpricing. They're saying that more in a SaaS context, but I think it happens in marketplaces quite a bit too. Uh, anybody can just try to say, hey, we have a lower take rate, so come on board. But ultimately, I don't think supply sticks around for a lower take rate. People tried this in food delivery. They tried having 0% take and then creating white labeled apps for customers. Uh, a couple of those companies have never broken out. Um, it's actually, ironically, you know, the market leader right now, DoorDash, um, has one of the highest take rates in the business. So I don't know uh, lower uh, take rates is really the way to go. Um, Nick Forsberg asks, what tactics can you use to attract uh, and onboard new supply if you're a startup? I'd say it's guerrilla marketing, finding that hole, finding ways to target this new, uh, you know, inventory that couldn't even be on before, you know, for DoorDash, that was calling restaurants that even have a driver in it and saying, hey, don't you want to get free money? You don't have to do anything. Just let us press this button. People will come in. You know, Postmates, get it now, initially took it a step further. They didn't even need a deal with the restaurant. They just sent somebody in with Postmates credit card to buy the food. So that's an interesting way to unlock supply. You don't even need to, to call the supply. You just find a way to interface that with them um, by sending in someone to buy stuff. So there's all kinds of creative ways. And I would say get really creative there. Um, uh, okay, last question I'm going to take, and then I think we're, uh, well, I'll do two more, uh, and then we're out of time. One is Keith Farrell. Uh, great presentation, Mike. Um, do you have any thoughts on the future of ed tech? And yeah, I think the future of ed tech is huge. So I think, you know, in this pandemic environment, we're seeing an explosion in future of work, obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, online learning. Uh, I think for marketplaces, any video uh, services over, I'm, I'm very interested in anyone de delivering a video experience. So these same marketplaces we were partnering with at Yelp uh, across all kinds of categories, accounting, lawyer, telehealth, uh, you know, even seeing like parent advice or uh, even like home services, someone could give you plumbing advice over video, all this stuff for video. I think those are huge and online learning is a big part of that. So finding, way to, finding ways to unlock a lot more supply there, um, I think is pretty interesting. And the last question I have to take is Paul Sebulak, a former colleague uh, who's a marketplace guy as well. Uh, he, he said, hi, Mike, long time. Can you speak about the rise of managed marketplaces um, and those in heavily regulated industries? Um, it's a great question. I think there's a big rise between the full laissez-faire marketplaces um, and then these managed marketplaces you're seeing more and more. And the question is just like, when do you become so managed that you're running the product experience yourself and it's not even a marketplace anymore? Uh, but I think there's a big opportunity there. And I think that's, again, a way to unlock supply that others aren't touching. So I think whenever you're seeing something that seems contrarian or hard, that's when actually you know you're hitting something interesting. Okay, guys. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, that wraps up the session. Again, you can reach me. I'll um, put it in the chat um, uh, uh, at new Mike on Twitter and uh, looking forward to connecting with more of you and appreciate your time today. Thanks a lot.